I really like the self-reinforcing objects. I mean, it's just, a, yeah. just so I understand, one way to create a lot of the same kind of object is make them self-reinforcing. Yes. So self-reproduction has this property, right? Like if a system can make itself, then it can it can persist in time, right? Because all objects decay, they all have a finite lifetime. So if you're able to make a copy of yourself before you die, before the second law eats you or whatever people think happens, um, then that structure can persist in time. So that's a way to sort of emerge out of a random soup, out of yes. the randomness of soup. Right, but things that can copy themselves are very rare. Yeah, um, And so what ends up happening is that you get structures that enable the existence of other things. Mm -hmm. And then somehow, only for some sets of objects, you get closed structures that are self-reinforcing and allow that entire structure to persist. Right, so the one object A reinforces the existence of object B, but you know object A can die. Yeah. So you have to like close that loop. Right. So this and is the classic all idea. very unlikely statistically, yeah. but you know, that's right. sufficiently um it's <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. There it's is low a chance. probability and then but once you solve that, once you close the loop, you can create a lot of those objects. And that's what we're trying to figure out is what are the causal constraints that close the loop. So there is this idea that's been in the literature for a really long time that was originally proposed by Stuart Kaufman as really critical to the origin life called autocatalytic set. So autocatalytic set is exactly this property. We have A makes B, B makes C, C makes A, and you get a closed system. But the problem with the theory of autocatalytic sets is incredibly brittle as a theory, and it requires a lot of ad hoc assumptions. Like you have to assume function. You have to say this thing makes B. It's not an emergent property, the association between A and B. And so the way I think about it is much more general. If you think about um, these histories that make objects, it's, it's kind of like the structure of the histories becomes... Um, collapses in such a way that these things are all in the same sort of causal structure and that causal structure actually loops back on itself to be able to generate some of the things that make the higher level structures. Lee has a beautiful example of this actually in molybdenum. It's like the first non-organic autocatalytic set. It's a self-reproducing molybdenum <laughs> ring, uh, mm. but it's like, like molybdenum and and basically, like, if you look at the molybdenum, it, it makes a huge molybdenum ring. I don't remember exactly how big it is. It might be like 150 molybdenum atoms or something. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the configuration space of that object, you know, it's exponentially large how many possible molecules. So, like, why does the entire system collapse on just making that one structure? Mm -hmm. If you start from, like, you know, molybdenum atoms that are maybe just, like, a couple of them stuck together. And so what they see in this system is there's a few intermediate stages. So there's, like, some random events where the chemistry comes together and makes these structures structures. And then once you get to this very large one, it becomes a template for the smaller ones. And then the whole system just reinforces its own production. How did Lee find this molybdenum? Uh, uh, <laughs> close uh, loop. <laughs> if I knew how Lee's brain work, I think I would understand a so lot this, more about the universe. But I <laughs> this is not an algorithmic discovery. It's a like, no, but um, but you, I think it goes to the deepest roots of like when he started thinking about origins of life. So I like I, I mean I don't know all his history, but like what he's told me is um, he started out in crystallography. Um, and, you know, there's some things that he would just, you know, like people would just take for granted about chemical structures um, that he was like deeply perplexed about. Like, just like, why are these like really intricate, really complex structures forming so easily under these conditions? And he was really interested in life, um, but he started in that field. So he's just carried with him these sort of deep insights from these systems that seem like they're totally not alive and just like these metallic chemistries um, into actually thinking about the deep principles of life. So I think he already uh, he already knew a lot about that chemistry and he also, um, you know, assembly theory came from him thinking about how these systems work. Uh, so he had some intuition about what was going on with this molybdenum ring. The molybdenum might be able to be the thing that makes a ring. They knew about them for a long time, but they didn't know that the mechanism of why that particular structure form was autocatalytic feedback. 
Um, and so that's what they they figured out in this this paper. And I actually think that paper is revealing some of the mechanism of the origin of life transition because really what you see, like the origin of life is basically like you should have a combinatorial explosion of the space of possible structures um, that are too large to exhaust. And yet you see it collapse on this, you know, really small space of possibilities that's mutually reinforcing itself to keep existing. That is the origin of life. There's some set of structures that result in this autocatalytic feedback. Yeah. And is it, what is it, a tiny, 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 tiny percent? I think it's a small space, but chemistry is very large. So, and so like, uh, there might be a lot of them out there, but we don't know. And one of them is the thing that probably started life on Earth. That's right. Or many, many starts. Yes. 